right, welcome to Discovery Church. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house, you guys. Amen. We are in this sermon series called Ephesians, where we're just going through the entire New Testament book. It's actually a, a letter, six chapters in all. We're going through and studying it verse by verse. And I like to do this at least once a year, where I'll take a book of the Bible and kind of uh, dig in for the summer, usually, and do a, a Bible study in a, a series of messages where you go just deeper into the Word of God. I like teaching in a variety of ways, because I think we grow best when we're exposed to different types of teaching and methodologies of teaching, but specifically this kind of series where we're doing a, a book study and going verse by verse, very intentional, because I just don't want to be the only one studying the Bible up in here, man. I want us all to know our word, amen? So in this series, I actually ask you to bring your Bibles, I've been asking you. Let me see those Bibles. Who brought their Bibles today? Look at you guys. Everyone else feels ashamed. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Y'all, I saw some people lifting up their phones like, I got my Bible right here. It's all good. I understand. You got it there. And I got sermon notes for you too. And you got that there. It's all good. But I really, I'm really encouraging you to do, we have three more weeks in the series, six weeks in all, is to actually grab your papal Bible, bring it with you, uh, preferably a study Bible. Because again, I don't only want to be the one studying. I want you to study this, this word with me and come to uh, build a relationship engaging with the Word of God personally. Uh, I remember the first time that I read the book of Ephesians. When I was 20 years old, when I, when I really gave my life to Christ, I'll preface it with that. That was like my real full surrender when I was uh, 20 years old. I was so hungry for the Word of God, you guys, so in love with Jesus and what He did in my life and um, transformed me and changed me. But I had never read a book entirely in my whole life, like at 20 years old. I'm serious. I don't know how I graduated anything. <laughs> the only books I read were probably comic books, but, but uh, I, I got hungry for this thing. And I remember reading Ephesians, and it was just so powerful. I remember still the feeling today of coming across some of those truths and being so impacted by it. A first-generation Christian, not really knowing Bible, Christianity, anything like, like that, or even, you know, reading... Uh, books, I just, but I was impacted by it. I just want you to know that wherever you're at in your faith or even in your development, God can speak to you right where you are. Wherever you're at, He can speak to you through His Word to where, like, even now, many years later, now with my master's degree and a doctorate degree, I could still read Ephesians and be wowed and amazed by the insight of God because that is the power of God's word. It will speak to you right where you are, wherever you are, in any stage, in any season. And, and so I was actually doing some research this last week about the state of biblical literacy in America. And this is a survey that's done. It's called the American Bible Society. They do this survey and study every year to kind of assess Christianity in America as it relates to the scriptures. And what they discovered this year in the 2024 report, it was just released recently, they said that 34% of church-going Christians, only 34% of them are engaging their Bible weekly. Um, so, I mean, you, we, if you're coming to church, you're engaging the Bible. So there's like, there's just the biblical illiteracy of, of American Christians is at like an all-time high. And I just don't want that to be said of Discovery Church. I want us to know our word and have a foundation on the word of God. In the same report, though, the same survey, it said that there has um, never been, at least in the last decade or more, a hunger for God's word. People desire to know and read God's word like never before. But there's a gap between this, right? Between our desire that's there and actually doing it. And I think the gap has to do with the belief that this thing is too complex for me. Like it's just, oh, that's too deep. It's too hard. I need someone to teach me that thing. I'm not a good reader. I'm not very smart. We have all these limiting beliefs and diminishing um, mindsets that are preventing you from actually engaging the Word of God, right where you are. And I hope that you're getting that. I hope you're picking up on this in this series that, that you cannot be, you'll not be an effective disciple of Jesus or a follower of Jesus if you don't have a relationship personally with the Word of God. Amen, somebody? Okay, so let's turn those pages to Ephesians chapter 3. Open up those Bibles. Or if you got the sermon notes, we're going to jump into those as well. If you didn't bring uh, your Bibles, grab your sermon notes. And we'll be in Ephesians chapter 3. Last two weeks, we studied Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2. So you can catch up 
encourage you to do that online or on YouTube. But Ephesians chapter 3 is a little bit unique of a chapter because Paul is kind of concluding one thought. The, the book is divided really into three chapters. The first three, Paul is expressing about our identity in Christ, our position in Christ. It's really, it's heavily theological. But then on the next three chapters, four, five, and six, it's about the practice of Christ or the working of our faith as it relates to every area of our life, like in our homes, in our workplaces, in the marketplace. We should like, your faith is worked out in practice as well, not just internally, but externally. So four, five, and six will get really practical, but he's closing out this chapter and it's written very um, differently and uniquely. So I'm actually going to do something different today. I'm going to teach this a little bit differently than I did the first two sermons. In those previous sermons, I would do a few scriptures and I'd give you a truth and do a few scriptures and give you a truth. I'm going to change it up and I'm going to give you the, like the first half, really Ephesians chapter three, breaking down into two chunks. Chapter three, verse one through about 13, we're going to read it all together, all at once. And I'll glean some insight and revelation from it and teach you some stuff. We're going to study the Bible today. Y'all ready to study the Word of God? So we're going to read that together. We're going to study it. And then I'm going to give you some important truths from that text. And then we're going to finish Ephesians chapter 3 with what Paul wants us, how he wants us to live. I'm going to teach you how to live in the overflow of God's power. How many want to live in the overflow of the power of God in here, okay? All right, so we're going to learn that. Paul's going to teach us, and that's what we're kind of close with. All right, y'all ready to study the Word of God, Ephesians chapter 3? Let's jump in, verse 1. I'll make it really practical for you. We'll study it together. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, now the reason is the other thing, like for what I shared with you in chapter 1 and chapter 2. He said, for this reason, like being chosen by God and, and being adopted by God and all these things, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you, Gentiles, let me time out right here and, and kind of remind you guys that the Apostle Paul is writing this letter from prison in Rome. So he's in prison, but he doesn't say, I, Paul, a prisoner in Rome. He says, I, Paul, a prisoner in who? In Christ. So this is a totally different context on his problem and on his situation that we need to see, we need to glean from. Because the Apostle Paul is showing us that you can endure any what if you have the right why. Paul was able to endure suffering and pain and hardship and imprisonment because he knew his life was not his own, that everything that came into his life passed through the nail-scarred hands of Jesus, that he was able to say, I am not my own. I am not here in prison in Rome. I'm actually imprisoned by the will of Christ. See, some of us, our theology is messed up here. We, we think if it's good, it's God. And if it's bad, that's the devil, or it's not. If it hurts, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. That can't be God. And, and, and you need to get a theology for pain and suffering, or you're going to miss the purposes of God in your life. The Apostle Paul is showing us, even in this pain, God is in it. I'm not a prisoner to the pain. I'm a prisoner in Christ. Are y'all seeing this with me? Come on, verse 1, we're going at it. Let's go. Verse 2. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly in these other two chapters. And he speaks of this word mystery. When you see this word mystery in the New Testament, it isn't like the usual kind of whodunit thing that we thought, y'all watch mystery stuff on Netflix. And that's not what he's talking about. A mystery in the New Testament means something that was hidden for a time, but is now been revealed through the Holy Spirit to God's family. That's what it means, a mystery. A mystery is something that was hidden for a time that is now revealed through the Holy Spirit to God's family, his people. Let's look at it. Verse 4. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, they didn't know about the stuff that we're revealing to you through the word of God now. As it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery, he's going to tell us what it is, is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Three, see, we're going to actually study these three things in just a moment. I'll tell you what this mystery means. Members together, heirs together, sharers together. We're going to talk about that. Verse 7. I became a servant of the gospel 
by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people. Does anyone ever feel like that? Like, man, I'm just the least qualified up in here. What could I do? I am the less of the least. Obviously, someone else could do better than that. Why me? I mean, I shouldn't really do. Here's the Apostle Paul admitting something here. Like, I, I'm the less than the least of all Lord's people, but this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Now, when Paul says he's the less of the least, he's, this isn't like false humility or something. He's just really acknowledging the depth of the forgiveness of God that has been displayed in his life. You see, Paul, you got to know Paul's life to understand him saying, like, I'm the less than, I'm less than the least of all God's people. Paul used to be one of those religious Pharisees that was against Christ, that was against the church, and against the disciples. In his former life, like before he met Jesus, he was a persecutor of the church. He would go take Christians from their home, drag them out, and throw them into prison to be either in prison or killed. Now this guy, Paul, who is dragging Christians into prisons, is now in prison himself for preaching the gospel he persecuted. How awesome is God here? But this is why he's saying, I'm the less of the least of all the Lord's people. Now, if you want to read about Paul's conversion, that's in the book of Acts, chapter 9. He actually was on what's called the road towards Damascus, and he was going to persecute some Christians, throw them into prison. And Jesus manifested himself in a shining light, in a voice, uh, like right in front of him, knocked him off his horse, changed his life. His name actually was Saul of Tarsus. That's where he was from. And God so dramatically <laughs> encountered him, he changed his name to Paul. And, and so you can read about that in Acts chapter 9. But that's where he's saying, he's just saying, look, I've been forgiven of so much. And for some reason, God chose me anyway. How many of you believe that God can choose you no matter your background, okay? Verse 9, and, make, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. This was hidden. The mystery was kept hidden in God. Now remember, the mystery of how Jesus would come and bring us together, members together, sharers together, heirs together in the kingdom. This was hidden in God. His intent, look at verse 10, his intent was that now, through the church, that's us, the people of God, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Here, here's what the Apostle Paul is revealing to us, you guys, that not even angels and demons knew the plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. How he would come and what he would do was kept hidden for, for a time that now the angels and demons are learning about a relationship with God and what the power of God looks like through the church. How beautiful is that, man? Look, if Satan knew, if, if Satan knew the plan before the death and resurrection of Jesus, he would have never killed Jesus. If he knew that by those stripes I would be healed, this we would all be healed, if he knew that, and look, this, is, this was the plan that was hidden. I know that we have familiarity with Jesus and maybe even familiarity with the gospel, but this is a beautiful, powerful mystery that Paul is like, guys, this is the manifold wisdom of God that is revealed through the church that no one knew. No one knew that God would empty himself of divinity and take on humanity. And, and, not, and live a human life, not as Superman God, but as a man fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And then, not like rule and reign like they thought he was going to do, but to take upon his flesh the punishment that we deserved. And then to defeat death rise from the grave, sit on, enthroned in heaven, and by faith in him, I would be indwelled by the Spirit and take a seat with him in heavenly places. What a, what a poetic, beautiful story that was like hidden. No one knew. Angels didn't know. Demons didn't know. The plan of redemption, how God would create a way for us to not only be redeemed, but have an inheritance waiting for us in heaven. Powerful. Verse 11. According to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. 
We, we, it's not by our sacrifices. It's not by what we do in religious systems and practices. It's in Christ. We can approach the throne room of God in freedom with full confidence. And then he says, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are actually for your glory. So let's talk about this manifold wisdom of God that is revealed in the church, in his people, to the angels and principalities. He says we are, here's, here's the, the mystery, heirs together, members together, sharers together, Jews and Gentiles, all people alike, one people. What does this mystery mean? Let me give you the three things, what this means. And this is actually Paul just kind of recapping what he's already shared, but let me share it with you in the context of the mystery that is revealed in Christ. Here's the first, what does it mean? What's the mystery mean? Number one, we are saved not by our works, but by the work of Jesus. We are saved not by our works, but by the work of Jesus. Can I get an amen right there? Because that's really great news, okay? Let's consider how the Jews and Gentiles would have actually received this amazing mystery revealed by Paul. These, these churches, by the way, Ephesus and surrounding churches, would have a few Jews in them, primarily Gentile believers, non-Jews, but they would have some Jews in there. And for the Jews, their expectation of the Messiah was that he would be this political figure that was going to bring like a restoration of the kingdom of Israel. He would rebuild the temple. And they thought the Messiah was going to reinstitute proper sacrificial system of worship. Their mindset was like, oh yeah, the Messiah is going to come and then we'll get back to like Really, the sacrificial system of, uh, of the temple, they had no thought process of, of a relationship with God that was not based upon our own works and what we could do or sacrifice ourselves. And the Gentiles were very similar. They had like religious practices that were very transactional in their relationship with deities. So Paul's message of grace would have necessitated a significant shift in their theological worldview, and it still does today. It, it introduced a relational rather than transactional approach to faith, where God's love and God's acceptance, it wasn't something to be earned, it was freely given. It was, it was not through our works, but through Jesus' work. Let's look at it again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. It says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. This is a mystery revealed in Christ that Paul is talking about here. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by the work of Jesus. And now, many of you here, it's not, you don't have this hang-up that maybe they had a theological worldview shift because of the way they related to their religious deities or their practices of religion. It was a very works-based. You might not have that, but you do have a, a very, most of us have a works-based philosophy. Like we are defined, most of us are defined by what we do. When you ask someone, who are you? How do they respond? Maybe their name, and then they go right to what they do. And this, and this is what I do. But do you know, listen to me, do you know who you are separate from your work? Do you know who you are apart from what you do? Do you have an identity apart from the things that you are producing and, and doing? If, if you don't, if you have this like works-based relationship with God, if it's like, even your relationship with God, if you, do you know who you are in Christ apart from what you're doing for Christ? Because if, if you don't, then you will produce fruit not in keeping with the Holy Spirit. Okay, if it's a works-based relationship, it, it's, it's not Christianity. Romans chapter 3 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. It's the grace of God that becomes now this initial source, the foundation of our relationship with God. It's the whole reason why we can approach God with freedom and confidence because of his grace, not based upon my works, not on what I could do, on what Jesus has done. This was a mystery revealed that they wouldn't understand that we need to catch. Number two, the second thing this means Members together, heirs together, sharers together. Number two, we have been given the Holy Spirit as a deposit and mark of new citizenship. We're given a new identity through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit not only gives us access, he also makes us part of the family of God, that we are now citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Ephesians 1, 14 says, When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, 
who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. See, when we believed in Christ, we were marked with a seal, he says, the Holy Spirit. In ancient times, the seal was a mark of ownership and authenticity. A king would seal letters with like a signet ring. And and that would indicate that that document was genuinely from them, but it also carried with it his authority. See, God seals us with the Holy Spirit, marking us as his own. But not only his ownership, we now are representatives of the king's authority. Come on, somebody say amen. We are marked by the seal of God. And not only this seal is a guarantee of our future inheritance. Think of it like an engagement ring. The seal of the Holy Spirit living inside of us is like an engagement ring, a promise of what's to come. The Holy Spirit is in us is a pledge, God's pledge, that he will fulfill his promise in us and to us. He will fully redeem us one day. But it's not just a future inheritance. It's, it's, it's also a transformative present reality. The power of the Holy Spirit makes us from foreigners and strangers to citizens of heaven. Look at Ephesians 2.19. Consequently... You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Paul's words here are so revolutionary that this is a mystery revealed that we would actually be given the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God to live inside of us, seating us with him, making us new citizens, family of God. Beautiful. Then the third, what does this mean? The third part of the mystery that we have been transferred to a new kingdom with authority and power over the kingdom of Satan. Man, this was something that the angels didn't know, demons didn't know. But in Christ, we are transferred to a new kingdom and have power over the enemy. This new kingdom isn't just a future reality. It's a present experience. We live out the power and authority given to us in Christ. Ephesians 2.6 says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Man, that verse is a game changer right there, you guys. I don't know if you understand that. God has not just rescued us from sin. He has elevated us with Christ, seated us in heavenly realms. That seated signifies a position of authority and victory. See, we're not merely just subjects in the kingdom of God. We're co-heirs with Christ, sharing his authority. In Christ, you're not just a resident of heaven, you're royalty in heaven. Come on, somebody say amen. This heavenly seating, it means that we operate from a place of victory, not striving for it, but we operate from victory, not for victory. This this elevated position, it's not just like, like symbolic, it's practical. It means you have authority and, 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 and a position over the powers of the enemy. 1 John 4, 4 says, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's operating in the world right now. We are overcomers because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The power within us is greater than the power in the world. It means this, that no matter what challenges come, no matter what spiritual battles that you're going to face, you can stand firm and victorious because of who is inside of you. With Christ in you, darkness has no power over you. We're not helpless. We're powerful. We're not victims. We're victors in Christ. The Apostle Paul is is, is urging us to walk in the reality of our heavenly position, to exercise our authority that he's given to us to live as overcomers in Christ. The mystery that is revealed now, the manifold wisdom through his body, the church. Then what Paul does with the rest of chapter 3, he concludes this entire section of his letter with a doxology. And that may sound like a religious fluffy term, but let me just explain it to you. A doxology is simply a statement of praise. That's all that is. We've read a few of them in Ephesians already. Paul would often in his letters just kind of write in the middle like a doxology. More specifically though, he would usually write these statements of praise in his letters right after some deep theological truths that he would drop, just like he did here in the beginning of Ephesians 3. He's like dropping mysteries and revelation. And and then he would just go on to doxology, which is the, Paul is actually showing us something here. He's not just bursting out with like a statement of praise. He's still teaching. He's still educating us by the the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Theology, what should follow theology should always be doxology. Meaning this, it's, it, this is truly the purpose of right theology. Right theology ought to lead to a high doxology. Let me say it this way. A right thinking about God ought to lead to right worship of God. See, when you, when you get like deeper in theology and the mysteries of God and knowing God's word, it shouldn't puff you up. It should cause you to bow down low. It should cause you to worship and praise God and glorify God. So Paul is teaching us something here by introducing the mysteries of faith and theology and depth and truth, how he bursts into a statement of praise. He's showing us what follows your knowledge should be humility and praise. Let me show it to you right here, beginning with verse 14. He says, for this reason, I mean, the mysteries, as he says, have been revealed to me. I'm the least of all these people, but yet God is using me. So for this reason, I kneel before the Father. I'm not standing up tall, puffing my chest out like, oh, yeah, I, I, I've got all this understanding. No, for this reason, I kneel before my Father. I'm not going to stand taller. I'm going to get down lower. Now, is it necessary for you to kneel while you pray? No, it's not. You don't need to kneel while you pray, but I do think it's a good practice to do every now and then to humble yourself. The, the kneeling in prayer is bending our will to align to God's. By kneeling in prayer, it's, it's, it's a physical posture, but it reflects a spiritual position, right? And we often do this, like even like fasting. Fasting is like, it's that diminishing and subjugating the flesh so our spirit can be strengthened and take its rightful place. Kneeling often does that. It reminds your body, go lower, humble, humble yourself. But kneeling isn't an easy action. It requires effort. Some of us a lot more than others as you get older, okay? My knees get worse and worse, and I'm telling you. So it, it's a conscious decision to lower ourselves. Paul says this is, this, is the, this is the beginning of his praise. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Another verse uh, says, although we are, we're being wasted away in our outer man, our inner man is being re renewed day by day. Although we're wasting away, my knees are getting bad, my necks are getting, my neck is getting, my back's getting bad. My, my outer being is wasting away, but inwardly I'm being renewed day by day, the power of the Holy Spirit within me. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love. Think about roots. What do roots do? Roots anchor a plant. They provide stability and draw nourishment from the soil. Being rooted in God's love means you are firmly anchored in love. That that's what provides your nourishment and your stability is you being rooted in love. That you may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Paul wants us not just to understand this love intellectually, but he wants us to experience it deeply in our hearts, like rooted deeply in love, to not just know, but to experience the power of love rooted inside of our hearts. This love is boundless. It surpasses intellectual understanding. This love will change your life. It will fill you. It will overflow in every aspect of your life. God's love is wide enough to include everybody, long enough to last forever, high enough to take us to heaven, and deep enough to reach the worst of us, the least of all sinners. Amen, somebody? Amen. To know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And the church said, amen. He concludes this section at least, chapter three. Now, how do we live this way? The way that Paul wanted us to live, the way that he's praying and describing here this immeasurably more life in the power of God. One translation says exceedingly abundantly above more, okay? How do we do that? I'm gonna give you five principles to living in the overflow 
of God's power. Here they are. Number one, if you want to live in the overflow of God's power, you got to embrace. you got to learn how to embrace divine imagination. Embrace divine imagination. I'm talking about expanding your vision beyond your circumstances, beyond your limitations, to dream big with God and trust Him, even if they look like it's impossible. I love verse 20. This is one of my life verses. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power at work within us. God's ability far exceeds your highest requests and your wildest dreams, but it isn't about what we ask for. It's about what we imagine, he says. Your imagination is the limit. And even then, God can do more. Our biggest dreams are God's smallest tasks. I don't know about you, but I want to live in the overflow of God's power. I want to imagine, learn how to imagine the unimaginable. How to believe what is unbelievable. You know how we can begin to do that? How we can begin to develop this this first principle, embracing divine imagination. How we begin to do that? Calling on God. You got to learn how to call God on God. You know, there's this Bible verse that's been said, it's God's phone number for years, for a long time it's been called. This is God's phone number. It's Jeremiah 33 verse 3. Here's you want to dial God? Jeremiah 33 3. It says, God says, call to me. Call me. I know you want to call other people, get their advice, their opinions, but God says, give me a call. Here's my number, 333. Just dial 333. Jeremiah 333. Call to me and I will answer you. Come on, you can try to call them. They might leave you on red. They might, after one, one, one ring, you go to voicemail. Do you know what I'm talking about? You're like, I know you did that on purpose. Why are you ignoring me? God's like, God's like, hey, call to me, and I'll answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. You know what this verse is? This verse is an invitation to divine dialogue. That's what it is. God wants to, God is inviting you to divine dialogue, to engage him, to reach out to him in prayer, and then expect him to answer. We sang about that today. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. Come on, that's why I trust him. This promise is so powerful. Not only does God answer, but he says, I'm going to actually reveal to you things that are unsearchable. Those are things beyond our understanding, beyond our plans, beyond our purposes, things that were hidden, but are made known by revelation through the Holy Spirit. This is divine imagination. It's, it's seen through God's eyes. It's perceiving his plans. It's, it's believing his promises, even when it doesn't seem possible. We have to be able to see it, because unless you can see it by faith, you will never live it in reality. We have to, we have to exercise, embrace divine imagination. I want to live in the overflow. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them, I want to live in the overflow. All right, the, half of you will keep going. The other half, I don't know what you're going to do for the rest of the time, but for those of you that do, I want to live in the overflow of God's power. Okay, number two, step into divine assignments. Step into divine assignments. Okay, there are specific tasks and roles that God has for you. It's the good work, the Apostle Paul says, that God has planned in advance for you. If you want to live in the overflow of God's power, you're going to le- learn how to step into the divine assignments of God. I love Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. This is the best example of stepping into the dis- divine assignments of God. He says, I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. This is the best example of a response to someone calling on God and by revelation God saying I'm going to send someone and the response of availability the response like no matter I don't wherever you want me to go however you want me to go whoever you want me I'm available and ready to serve and I'm going to trust that you equip who you call God here I am send me now if you don't know what divine assignments that God has for you then then you need to at some point in your journey here at Discovery you should attend track two. Uh, we call it purpose. We help you discover your purpose, your gifts, your spiritual gifts, the divine assignments of God in your life. If you've never attended that, you're missing out. If you want to live in the overflow of God's power, we got to learn how to step into divine assignments. Here's number three. We got to cultivate a spirit of radical generosity. I'm, I'm not talking about 
just mere giving here. I'm talking about embodying a lifestyle that reflects God's abounding grace. A lifestyle that reflects God's abounding love. Look at Acts chapter 4. This is the early church. How did the early church respond to um, the gospel, to, to this mystery that is revealed for the very first time, this good news, all this stuff that we're learning here that Paul's right? How did the early church, the first church, respond to this amazing truth? Look at what it says in Acts chapter 4. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. Hey, if you want to live this way to cultivate a spirit of radical generosity, you got to shift your perspective. you got to view your possessions as gifts from God meant to be shared. Okay, everything we have is from God, and we are stewards of his blessing. Stewardship starts with seeing. you got to see your possessions differently. They said, we didn't see our possessions as our own, but they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, all that there were no needy persons among them. It's no coincidence that the power of God was being demonstrated while they were living with radical generosity. These two things go together. Radical generosity and the power of God. And I'm not saying you can't own anything, but I am saying as a disciple of Jesus, you should recognize you're not really the owner. That you don't own anything. In fact, your life isn't even your own. You were bought. Your life is not your own. And it doesn't have to be huge. In fact, the spirit of generosity often starts really small and grows from there. You begin with small acts of generosity. And then it grows. It might, it might start with serving on a team at Discovery. It might start with being a part of outreach. It just starts small. Generosity doesn't require great wealth. It requires a, a, a willing heart. Remember, small seeds grow big harvests. Come on, amen, somebody, y'all with me today? Is it too warm up in here, y'all with me? Okay, let me hurry up. I got, let me give you another one. You got to live, live, five principles to live in the overflow of God's power. Number four, we have to develop relentless resilience. Relentless resilience. Here's why. If you're going to live in the overflow of God's power, Please hear me, rest assured, you will meet the onslaught of the enemy schemes. You're going to have to learn strength and perseverance in trial, in challenges. You're going to have to develop relentless resilience under fire and pressure. This is what James is talking about in James chapter 1. He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. What a counterintuitive command. But this is because trials, they might not be pleasant, but they are purposeful. Look what he says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And this perseverance isn't just about getting by, it's about growing through it. Look what it says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He's talking about developing a growth mindset here. We have to learn to view challenges as opportunities for growth, not just obstacles in our way. Come on, if you want to live in the overflow, you, gotta, you can't get caught off guard just because you're enduring suffering and pain. Paul says, I'm not a prisoner to my pain. I'm a prisoner to Christ. If you want to live in the overflow of God's power, you got to develop resent, relentless resilience. That every trial is a chance to grow stronger in your faith. Every trial is a chance for you to develop character. Challenges are growth opportunities in disguise. And if you're going to live in the overflow of the power of God that the Apostle Paul is praying for us, then we have to develop this. I'm going I'm to go to this last one because I'm running out of time. Number five, the fifth principle to live in the overflow, practice bold declarations of faith. You got to practice bold. We have to take, take a, a cue from Paul here who's speaking faith over you now that you would live in the immeasurably more and the exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or imagine. May you be rooted and grounded. Man, you gotta, you gotta practice bold declarations of faith. Our words have power to shape our reality, to influence your life and your circumstances. But really, you wanna know what words are? Words are a reflection of your beliefs. That's what words are. The words that you're speaking are a reflection of what you are believing. Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. 
What comes out of your mouth has power. Our tongue can either speak life or death, blessing or curses, hope or despair. The words we choose to speak can uplift and encourage or tear down and destroy. We are called to speak life as children of God, to declare God's promises, to use our words, to build up our faith and the faith of people around us. I'm not talking about denying reality. I'm talking about affirming the word of God over your circumstances or even in spite of your circumstances. Because the reality is a lot of our words have more alignment and agreement with the world around you than the word of God. A lot of the words that we're, that we're speaking, some of you, you have belief. You've got to believe, but you haven't changed your confession yet. And because of that, you're still reaping the wrong fruit. You know what he says? He says, those who love it will eat its fruit. You know what fruit is? Fruit is produce. It's produce. Your words are the produce of your life. Your mouth is the fruit producer, either death fruit or life fruit. So some of you believe one way, but because your words have not changed, you're still reaping destruction and death. You, you, when you get in arguments and conversations, you got the talking points of your news station instead of the word of God. You got the wrong talking points. You need to change your vocabulary. You need to practice bold declarations of faith through God's word instead of what's agreeing with your circumstances, instead of what's agreeing with the world of the system. Practice bold declarations of faith. If you want to live in the overflow of God's power, this is so central to the kingdom of God, one of the principles of the kingdom of God, that it's even tied to your salvation. Even tied, because it, it's not just what you believe in your heart, it's what you say with your mouth. You know, because out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. Let me show it to you. This is biblical. Let me show it to you. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you declare with your what? With your mouth. Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. There is, there is an importance here of, of not just believing in your heart, but confessing with your mouth. See, some of you have, you, have, you have a heart belief. You believe, but yet there hasn't been true a lot of manifestation in your actions because it has never started with your words. You're still confessing the wrong things. And if you start to change your confession to line up with the faith of God's word to what you believe, I promise you, you're going to start eating different fruit in your life. You're going to start seeing different fruit from your life. The fruit on your tree. Jesus said, a good tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. From your life, the fruit on your life. If you want to bear different fruit, fruit of blessing and of favor in the kingdom, you got to change what you're confessing. Now, some of you even here right now, you're, you're beginning to believe. You're having something move inside of you. Like, like, like maybe even you're, you're ready to... To, to believe, but if your belief does not, does not turn into a confession of faith, there's no transformation. If it stays hidden, if it's just internal, God wants to move in you and through you. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.